the um, Hindus, as Sikhs and all of them were called, even the Muslims were called Hindu by the Australians. They came uh, from Punjab in the 1880s. There had been a famine in India and these were mainly people with farms and they came out here as farming labourers. Our family was one of the first families to settle here out in, on the north coast here. There's four brothers in the family and they all just bought their own farms and now it's, we're fifth generation here and uh, there's about 350 in the family now, yeah, all together. My dad's family were South Sea Islanders and they were labourers, banana farmers and all types of farms. My family came from the loyalties in the Caledonia, from New Caledonia, um, but they weren't any of the blackbirded ones that came out for the sugar, they just come out here of their own free will. Granny come from Santa, Santa. and grandfather come from Amboy. Yeah, yeah, Amboy. Our name's Tuku. There. They were naturalised French people when they come here. They brought them all out just to work in the cane. In Mackay, Maryborough, all that area, that was bad for uh, blackbird when they brought them into there. But when they left up there, they walked They walked all the way down into the Tweed. And that's where they all settled here in Coogeon. We grew up on the Tweed, worked on the farm probably ever since we could walk. My full name is Ellen Cecilia Petrie. Uh, I was born uh, Ella Cecilia Wagus and I was born in 5th of February 1929. And my father's name was uh, Roy Cecil Wagus. Uh, he was born in Mwilambari in 1902. But his father came from one of the islands called Modlop. My grandfather came out here as a 12-year-old uh, boy to Norfolk Island and he schooled him there when he was about 12 year old. But after that, he got sent to Queensland. It got too hard for the sugar cane cutting. And then so he, he ran away and he got a job with the oyster farmers up here in Brisbane. I was born in 1940 in Malamimbi Memorial Hospital. And my dad came out in a boat and they pulled up at Perth to start off with. And they weren't allowed to get off the boat there because of the White Australia policy. They went to Melbourne and they weren't allowed to get off in Melbourne for the same reason. And then they moved up to Sydney and it was for the same reason. Then they, the boat kept going and when he got to Townsville, they found out that we were related to Alexander the Great. So therefore, they took Dad in up at Townsville and they wanted hard cane cutters up there and for hard workers that were used to the hot sun. And that's where Dad started. And then he moved down to Mullumbimby and started growing bananas. He worked with bananas here until he passed away when he was very young, early 50s. I was born 22nd, the 10th, 1934. Punjab, district of Jalandhar. We came here in 1940. It was a bit of a touch and go. They held us at uh, Singapore and uh, just after we left there, the Japanese got Singapore. My father was very worried. He thought uh, we might be right in it. It was the last boat he came to Australia. And they came out here and they got lost. Somebody told them to go that way and and there uh, was no roads like now. It was a, it was a bush. So uh, there's, there was lost for three days. And uh, I don't know what they lived on leaves or something. <laughs> My dad left school at the age of 13 and he worked on his uncle's farm and he worked there um, planting and chipping bananas uh, for about three years and he had his 14th birthday out in the banana paddocks. He left there and then he went to Coogeon and started chipping and planting sugarcane. We started cutting cane when he was 17 years old and he started cutting cane up at Tambolgum, uh, Stotts Creek and he also came back to Coogeon and he did this for 16 seasons. Dad owned 160 acres, two horses we used to plough the fields, no tractor and uh, 
planted beans, peas, potatoes. Dad, I think, was the first one to cultivate sweet potatoes on the tweed. Started from there. I think he, on, in one, one year, I think he paid the farm off in potatoes. Because they used to use them years ago for pig feed. I think it cost Dad 160 acres, 1,700 pounds. And he paid them off with the sweet potatoes, a crop that he didn't even... he just go and get the vines off the walls and put it in the ground and it grew. It never cost him nothing. First, when the grandfather come out, they used to contract clearing, clearing undergrowth on the farm, see? There used to be about 30 young blokes in a gang and they'd take a contract off this 200 acres or 300 acre property. They'd brush all the, all the undergrowth. And another chap I was talking to, he said, I knew your father. He said, I remember, he said he got uh, 80 acres contract. He brushed the lantana and uh, burnt it and grubbed it for 80 pounds. Now, they'd work from daylight to dark. There were old stories, the old blokes used to even get at moonlight going out working. But not many ever brought their families out because the reason was India was developed and Australia wasn't. It was all, all, all scrubby. They said, it's not a place to bring a family. They used to just live together in a tent or a bit of a shed, whatever they got, they'd live. And they'd stay here maybe five, six years, maybe longer, some would, and that's all their money was sent back to India. When Mum come out here, there was only about, only about three, four, four Indian ladies here on the whole north coast. And when they came here, their wages were nothing. Julius bought the first cane plants in 1878 to the Tweed, and then Rob, John Rob, started, they joined together, and Rob employed Indians for two shillings a day, and the white people for 15 shillings, plus 12 and six board a day. Work was hard, and they'd take anything on. So uh, around Ballon and all those places, you see rock fences, the Indians done them. My dad went cane cutting, and see those days, that uh, it was pretty hard work and they, they were new and they weren't accepted. He bought a farm and uh, he borrowed a little bit of money off the bank and he was uh, so worried that the bank might take the lot and he couldn't keep the payments up. So he got me exempt from school when I was 12 years old. I left school probably 12 and a half, started working. Loved it. We I used to play the wag just so I could stay home and, and work on the farm. Kids be going to school, and I used to be going the opposite way to go home to work. <laughs> because it didn't. I think I learnt more by working than I did at school. Me and me and Mac Alan here, we we went to the grapes when we were 15 years old. We caught a, a, a grape picking train. They called it from Mullumbar to Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney to Melbourne. Albury, Melbourne. Yeah, 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 yeah. To Albury, then Victoria, the grape farmers society from Victoria paid for it. We went to Melbourne and then it was all men. You can imagine bloody like thousand men on a, on a train going picking. Of course we were only 15, we didn't think about it. We never, we wanted to make a fortune going and shoot rabbits. So we bought, we bought new rifles at an old car and we headed out, we headed out to Swan Hill. And uh, I always remember we, I told them, don't leave the water, we won't die of thirst anyway because we've seen a few rabbits as they were doing, they were going too fast, we couldn't shoot them. <laughs> so we end up selling the car and we end up living there in Melbourne in the Salvation Army place. Because the, the police picked us up for carrying rifles down the street. And uh, me and Alan, we hitchhiked out of there one, one couple of weeks we were there, hitchhiked to uh, Sydney with 50 cents in our pocket, or five shillings. Uh, we made a vow then when we was on the road and we said we'll never get broke again. Uh, the school teacher said to Dad, he said, uh, I can't teach him anything here. He said, your son, you better take him out and put him in the bananas. He said, <laughs> when he comes back, he's only talking about bananas anyway to the kids. <laughs> so, you know, so I left when I thought in half. We were born in the Depression, yeah, yeah. So we had a very hard time and we used to live down along the beach there where I said it was a tent or an old shack and uh, of course the pippies were all right then and I can remember my mother she made uh, uh, when there was soup to be made she had no veggies not much many veggies so you used to put um, 
the pumpkin leaves in the soup. I spent most of my time from the time I was probably about seven or eight out picking, helping pick beans and peas, um, either, or either going up to where they were cutting cane or always in the fields. We spent a lot of our time on the sugar cane trucks, which just ran past our house and still right near our house now. And um, we'd just rattle the train every afternoon from school. That's what we called it, rattling. The chap that drove it, one of them lived right next door. He was Roy Wogus. So he'd see us coming from school, cutting across the paddock, and he'd kind of slow down and let us jump on and we'd sit on the top of the trucks till we come all the way to Chindra. But we had to jump off about a quarter of a mile from our place because if our mum and dad had known about it, Roy would have been in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good, fun Christmas times when we were growing up. We'd spend six weeks fishing, swimming. So we had Uncle Tom, he used to live with us. He was an old and by man, he used to live with us. I uh, always remember going swim with him. He'd make sure, that's why I had a kid, he'd make sure I have shorts. But he used to go in the bush and get a little vine and get, a little, get his handkerchief and he'd strap his handkerchief around his private with this, this little bit of vine from the scrub and that's how he swam. But they could swim like fish, you know. So always have bow and arrows, just shoot fish with it down the lakes, make bow and arrows, shoot fish. And me and my brother used to be out in the middle of the river chase the fish into the mangroves and that's where they shoot them with the bow and arrow. My father joined the militia in 1935. Uh, he was about 19 years old and he was with that for about three years and he had to go to uh, Rutherford, uh, Lismore and Grafton to train. Uh, he, he also, when he came back from there, war had broke out on the 31st of August 1939. He was celebrating his 21st birthday at the Chindra Hall. And about six months after that, uh, they were called up, but he was pulled aside and told he had to stay for essential services because he was a cane cutter. He had to go down to the Richmond cutting cane. They'd get the train uh, bus to Moorlambar, uh, then they'd get the train on to Bangalore, and then they'd have to get a taxi out, out to the fields from there, which would take a whole day. <laughs> they'd have to do that again at the end of the week to come home. So two days were spent travelling, and then the rest of the time he'd be cutting cane, um, Half the chaps that were there had never cut cane before, so the two or three that could cut cane had to kind of carry them, and that's how they got the work done. I was 16 years old when I started cutting cane. I cut cane for 18 years. I started cutting cane when I was 17. I went to uh, Innisfail. I did come back and cut a season here, a couple of seasons. Like Alan, he, he, he cut a few seasons here. I cut yeah. probably five years here, then I went up to Paul Gilga. I would have been about uh, 22 when I first started, 22. Yeah, yeah, and I did 13 years. When I first started, uh, I did about uh, half a year shoulder load. You had to cut it, heap it up and shoulder load, and, and then, the, 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 then put it on the trucks. Very hard work especially when they were up on the flats up in Tobolgum because they had to cut, load and then take it down to the punts and reload it onto the punts by hand there. Um, and they used to get about two and sixpence a tonne, which is not very much money. But when they were working in Coogeon, if they happened to have lots of rats or um, uh, lots of stones, they could get the arbitrator in and I know at one particular time he said they got an extra thrippence a tonne because there were so many rocks and, um, you know, they thought that was pretty good. We used to get live black snakes in the, in the cane when we shoulder loaded them and everything. By the time you picked the cane up and threw it on the truck and all you see was a flying out, oh, 
you say to yourself, well, you know, you didn't have enough time to think because if you stop and thought about it, the chap on the other side, he'd be going up with his cane and you'd be down here, so you had to throw the cane a lot higher than the other bloke. So we didn't take much notice of him, really. Then, then the loaders come in. You would only cut it and drop it, and they would load it and pick it up. All cane cutting is hard. Makes, makes it worse is pacing another person. And uh, when you're pacing another person, you've got to keep your end up. Or, see, the money is pooled. Everybody gets an equal share in the fortnight. And if you don't pick up your, your weight, you're a long way behind, well, the other people don't want him. And they used to race one another all bloody day. It wasn't done that. Who could load their trucks first? And you had to get you know, not stay very behind him. You had to load yours just as nearly quick. It was all contract, you know. If you, well, if you wouldn't pull your weight, they said, there's a gate, go. I mean, you were young. You, I cut cane with a chap that was 65. He'd done 44 years there. It was just a knack. No, we were just particularly hard men. We had to work, work, work to uh, earn our keep. We had to keep going, 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 you know, it's like, so if you knew you weren't pulling your weight, you had to go a little bit harder. Because if you didn't, next year came around, you wouldn't be in that gang, you'd be looking for another gang to go to. Don't wait till dark it was. You got up in the dark and you'd come home in the dark. Just cut a old corn bag, cut a hole in the top and arms out. And we used to load in that and cut in that. And uh, the beauty of all, all was it that uh, it never had any sleeve for, to hold you back. Now going back to my father there, he would lay the rails in the farm. The farmers had to lay their rails down so the trucks would be, the cane cutters would load the trucks. And he would lay those rails on the farm. You were, uh, at the end of the day, you had to carry your portable steel rail across for the, the, the cane bins to come in. And you had to grab a handful of dirt because it was that hot and grab the rail. Two Carry. men, one following the front, one from the back. That's how heavy they are, and they click in together. We had a uh, two-litre bottle of water with us, and the farmer used to bring a drum uh, tank around with a tap on it where we used to fill our bottles up from when we run out. And that used to keep us going all the time. With a bit of water, a few cups of tea, a few beers at night. You get a new chum, I feel sorry for a lot of these blokes. First, all the gang be together, lest they even start the earlier season, they're all mates. And what they do is try and see how this bloke can work. Can he handle it? Is he a good worker? What they used to do, for the first quarter, they'd send another, me out just to push him, and you're working going hard. And you want a bit of a rest, they'd say, right, oh, David, you get up and push him for the next quarter. See how good of a bloke he is. And another bloke could take it in turns, and they'd say, he's a good worker. By the end of the day, you said, you're one of us, mate. You've got a job. Used to sign up to cut uh, so many tonne for a group. It could be eight or ten farmers, and uh, a cane growers association, and used to sign up. They used to keep so much of your money back for you to have a centre to finish the the, uh, the work, or if you didn't finish the work, you lose that retention money. The cost of the knife was produced by the farmers. They used to give you the cane knife to start with, and they also gave you the files to keep them sharp. But then towards the end, the gangs decided to use crosscut saws, cutting knives out of crosscut saws, which uh, Never cost us anything for the crosscut saw, but it used to cost us a little bit of money for the person to make the knives up for us, which was a better knife than the ones the farmers are producing. I used to make all my own knives at a crosscut saw because they, they held their edge better and they was thicker. If you start chipping, you get behind. And uh, one good hit and uh, you... Uh, goes through and sometime it comes through so fast it hits the other the, the, the left leg. I got little ladders all up my legs. 
Well, you probably see little marks up yeah, my legs yeah, there. Yeah. That's my cane knives. I cut my knee a few times. Cutting the limb, you know, just cut across. Yeah. You just have a lot of cuts and bruises on your legs from cane knives and that. Yeah. We used to wrap a, tear a part of your shirt off or something like that and you wrap it around and just keep going. On this one, you can see that there, mm. that, that the knife went through and my foot dropped. And then I, I used to, the doctor said to me, he said, look, make yourself a shield out of aluminium. So those uh, big pipe, water pipes, was aluminium, and I cut it in half, and, uh, and I put straps around it. I used to put a strap there, and the knife come through, I never hurt me. <laughs> I had a gang, yes. And uh, you had to keep them in time. And uh, be level-headed with them. You can hire and fire. You uh, always work good if you're happy. The gang negotiated the prices with the farmers. Sometimes the farmers didn't like giving you much money. They just said, no, you can't get that. Even when it's rat eating and lying, laying down and all that, you might be only getting trippings or sixpence a tonne. The gang was just a gang, but everybody had to work just as hard as him because everybody got the equal pay. Now, the mill had the price of the tonne, but it was really bad cane. You had to get that bit of extra money off the farmer. And the farmer was good enough. He said, all right, boys, I'll give it to you. And the boys were more happy. They would cut the cane better. But if there's some dispute, they would have to go to the inspector. The inspector would say, that's all I can give you. And if he wasn't satisfied, they go to an arbitrator that comes around and he takes the thing in the paddock. He said, that's all, you, all that's worth, that's all he's going to get. So they used to be always whinging, oh, no, we can't give you that much money. No, if you've got a couple of shillings on, on uh, a tonne extra, oh, they cry their eyes out. <laughs> the two-year-old cane, nobody liked that because it was very big and had to handle and, and you couldn't get the tonnage. It was big, but it was a lot of slower work, you know. Standing up came much easier to cut and drop and you'd, you'd, you'd do more tonnage in a day. The worse the cane, the more, a little bit more money you got. There was tricks in everything, like, and, and that. And some of the blokes, there, there was difference in the row. The drain row used to be a heavier row too because it was more drain, so I've got the canes on the flat and, and the cane doesn't like a lot of water. And they used to be the heaviest rows. A lot of blokes didn't want to get them rows because they knew they had to cut more cane. So they'd sort of hang back and, you know, go away and just make sure they didn't sort of get it. The first season on the Clarence, we had a cook. And he used to get it just the same as us, each man. And he used to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and start cooking. <laughs> so we used to live in the barracks down in Kindra and I used to be the cook. We used to go home and get the fire going for the bath, get the potatoes and everything else going to make the curries and everything to work, and, you know, for, the, for the, when they come home, make sure everything was going. So when they come home, they had a shower. Then they used to have a few rums or whatever. And, uh, yeah, so I used to cook for a fair while. Well, they had bad paddocks, which they said, look, that was all growing up. It went down, was doing about 60, 70 tonne a year. But they'd stand it over, it should be cut. And you've got a wet season, they'd just stand it over. The main plant drops and then you get the suckers grows up, see? And then when you go to cut it, the suckers, they don't want, the farmers don't want the sucker because the sucker's got no sugar in it. They say, cut the sucker, but throw it out. Don't put it in the heap, see? And the cutters were not making that money. They still had to work, throw their money out. They said, oh, we're not going to do that with the bag. Well, then that extra money what they sort of give to you know, to do it to do it and they couldn't make the money and a lot of times they used to have <laughs> they used to have a candle they put it in the middle of the paddock clean around it and just have a bit of thrash on the bottom that candle might take two hours or an hour and a half to burn we'd be sitting in the pub and they'd say oh that paddock's going up now so the candle used to go down a lot and the fire would go up be 10 15 acres of rubbish would burn and then they'd get other gangs in to help you cut it out. They used to say, you bastards, you did it with that. <laughs> we're going to get you back and we're going to do the same thing to you. <laughs> so they used to get their rubbish sort of cut off. There might be five or six gangs in to cut it, right? Eh? They used to blame the foxes. 
folks who burnt the tar and ran through the paddock somewhere else and let it go. <laughs> that was another good one. <laughs> you get some blokes, uh, you know, you can work near them all day and they tell the jokes all day. <laughs> they used to get the snakes, dead snakes, burnt snakes, and put them in the bundle of cane. When you lifted them up, the heads used to come down, you dropped the cane and everything, and you'd have the smell on you for the rest of the day because that was pretty on the nose. Yeah, they used to do that with snakes and rats and bandicoots and whatever they could find. You work as a team of blokes and you've got good blokes and they joke and argue all day. See, you get us in a big cane doing 100 tonnes of acre. I wouldn't have enough heart with a cane enough to go and cut the bloody thing. Hell, what am I going to do? How am I going to cut it? How am I going to pull it out? All this sort of thing. But you get a team of blokes in. You get ten blokes together. One's pushing the other. He might be bugging, like, right? it's a hot day. But he's making the pace. They said, oh, he's making the pace. We've got to stay with him. And one sort of said, oh, the other bloke got to keep up with the bloke about to catch mine. Some used to be that bad. They used to, if they caught them up, they'd take the row off them. And that was an insult to a cane cutter. We did work with a, a few... Uh, South Sea Islanders and Fijians, yes. They work well together. You know, us, uh, the dark people and the white people work well together in the cane. They did, and the bananas and everything else. We all the hard work, so there was a lot of mixture of people that really knew how to work and work hard. It was a, a unity of men. And, uh, and I miss that today. I... Uh, we used to look forward to signing on day. The women used to cut too, the Italian women, and they, they could cut cane. And even load, shoulder load. We used to go to strip the cane. What we used to do was we used to cut the cane for planting. That's how we used to strip the cane. The cane would come down, it would be cut for us, and it'd be in a big bundle right on the ground. So we'd pick it up the tip would be off it and the root would be off it and we'd just strip down like that. We'd just take a piece and strip it all the way down so that there was no thrash left on it whatsoever. And then they'd put it in the planter and feed it through the planter and it'd cut every so many notches and that's where it'd shoot. The eyes had come out right near where, the, where you stripped it to. That's why you had to strip it off so the eyes could come out. Oh, we had to have a pair of gloves on yeah. but we just um, stripped all the dead stuff off. There was one particular cane that was awful to work with. They call it Hairy Mary. And you had to have, you know, long sleeves, long, all protective clothing, or you'd get that in your skin. And, you know, you could get little festers and turn into boils if you weren't careful. Um, but there was a couple other good ones there was, that you could strip without getting all hair on you, you know. There was a red cane in particular, I think it was called Pinda and it was easy and good to strip. But as soon as they mentioned Hairy Mary, <laughs> we didn't like that. <laughs> uh, I used to drink at the courthouse mainly, and then we'd have a shower there and have about three or four schooners every afternoon come up. The old publicans loved our money, even the bar was black. It was all black and they're drinking, and they didn't care about the bar getting black, they just wanted their money because they used to drink heavy and work and they had the money. But now today, if a cane cutters went in anybody dirt and dirt that bar, they wouldn't even let you in the bloody pub. We kept this place going, there's no doubt about it. The actually the old blokes how the money the cane cutter used to put in here. But now you've got these machines, they're not they're taking it out of the bloody district. They had everything around Mobile and Bar. It was a very, very rich little place. When the harvesters came first down, we was a little bit disappointed because they had them on trial run there to start with and they was breaking down all the time. And we said, good, we'll get a couple more years out of this, you know, because we're making good money out of it. And then when the harvester did come in, we said, that's all right, now we're getting a bit old now for this game. So we thought, well, that's all right. Well, off season, I used to go down to the farmers and the uh, Jindra there, and I used to go through chip and cane for them there in the off season. Then, uh, I used to go out spraying blackberries uh, out at Nundal, Walker and Bendemere and all them places. And sometimes we used to go to Bathurst on the way down to Melbourne. We'd take the trucks back down to Melbourne, stop at Bathurst spraying uh, uh, blue wattle. 
and uh, we used to do all that in the off season. A season would go from about um, early July through to December and um, then he'd go on to fishing and then, until the next season started in the, in the sugar cane. But most of the workers around here all did the same thing. They'd either go fishing or work in the fields. Most of the farmers had um, crops, small crops, peas and beans. So that's where they'd get their living from when the cane season finished. We'd all go out picking beans, peas, when the, whatever was ready, you know, at the time, yes. Mainly it was in the winter time. And I'll tell you, you didn't want to get out of bed on a winter's morning. <laughs> My dad used to go prawning because my dad had a, a fishing licence as well. He was a professional fisherman as well as a cane cutter. And um, he used to have oysters as well. He had an oyster lease down the front. And he used to go prawning, fishing, and we'd have all these seafoods, you know. My elder sister, she used to open the oysters and they'd bottle them in either little ladies' waste bottles or pickle bottles, and he'd sell them. So then he, he also grew uh, watermelons, Indian creams, rock melons, cucumbers and corn and we'd have plenty of mangoes so he'd take those out along the beachfront at Kingscliff every Christmas. Um, all the campers would go from Woman Bay right down to, nearly to the creek and there'd be a road right through the middle and he'd go down with his old truck and he'd just sell all his fruit and we'd go with him. We were only little kids about this high and he'd be singing out, you know, watermelons, <laughs> guaranteed ripe and, you know, we'd be hiding in the back seat <laughs> so no one would see us in case there was someone we knew. And all the South Sea Islanders had grapes and pineapples so there was little stalls everywhere along the, the road selling them and my dad used to come down here to the ferry and he'd have mud crabs, grapes, pineapples, whatever he could, and they'd wait for all the cars to come across the ferry just down here on the river. And that's how they'd sell a lot of their produce as well. Instead of getting on the social service, I went out to make ends meet, you know, by working. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was away nine years. I cut timber. It was a dangerous game and it got killed three times. Some years I have uh, went out spraying blackberries and uh, used to start from uh, Len Ennis and right through to Gippsland. And uh, we used to stop in sheds and that, you know. One thing led to another. I went roo shooting and I'd done that a couple of years out there. And uh, then I got on to uh, 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 underground mining. I worked in timber, cutting timber cordwood for Boron Bay Meatworks. I worked in Bananas. I bought uh, 15 acres on Mays Hill, north of Balgam, up on the top. And um, I grew bananas there. The best part about bananas is you're doing some work in them, you can take a day off. See, it was a family sort of business. Yeah. Wife would do the packing. The kids on the weekend helped me cut, and in the school dollars, holidays I'd go up and help me strip or whatever job was done, but I'd pay them a bit of pocket money. They were all happy. I hate bananas when I had to go to. I didn't work in the bananas anyway, just packing. That's in all. The in the shed, that's all. Because sometimes it, uh, uh, snakes in the bunch. <laughs> yes, no, oh, I don't know, I didn't like it. Yes. Yeah, the kids used to be here, they used to make the cases underneath there, they make them every day after to school, you've got to make 100 or 50 cases a day, or all this. they'd make them. I used to um, do the ends of the cases, but we'd pull over a pack, of, a lot of uh, cases that were sort of packed and tied together the timber, sit on that and then uh, start making the, uh, that we put two boards together and cleats along the top bang, 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 and just lined them up. Sometimes I'd start cases too, but uh, that used to be my job if I did. But I spent most of the time cooking and doing things like that in the house. But Mum used to do it all. 
she'd uh, make ends, she'd make the cases and she'd pack. And she used to give my young brother some bananas and some nails and a hammer. And to occupy his mind, he used to hammer nails into the bananas that weren't any good. And then mum would later on, after their day was finished, kept asking him to put them in a certain place. She'd take all the nails out. I remember seeing her taking all the nails out of these bananas and putting them in with the, the good nails because they weren't bent or anything. But that would occupy him for ages. I started in the bananas down at Mullumimbi, but we also started in bananas when we were nine, ten years old. Help mum out. Because mum, that's the only thing mum had to uh, live off at that time. It was the bananas. And us kids was only very small and we used to cut bananas, pack bananas, make the cases. We got the bananas steamed at Condong Mill, the suckers. We walked them out around the mountain. You took a bar, a shovel and a mattock and you moved rocks and made holes. We dug the holes with the mattock, 17 acres we done. We were doing nine hours a day. We was, I was getting 12 pounds a week. Oh, there's farms up in Tommy and there that that steep. Mm. You, uh, they had ropes and that hanging down the side. It was there, you can pull yourself up. When the first started back in the 50s, they used to have these uh, flying foxes in the, in the paddocks. There was no, you couldn't get up, but there was no roads. And they used to still cut a fair bit of bananas because all you had to do is you didn't want a vehicle. You'd walk up, cut your bananas and put them on the stages and send them down by the flying fox or by wire to the shed. There's very deadly snakes. Death adders and rough scale and king brown. The eastern brown, they're very, very deadly. And uh, I've had, when I was at working at Numan Bar Valley for George Chester and son, I had a, a death that I got round me boot and bit the boot. <laughs> and I looked down and there's a, a big snake around me ankle. And uh, I shook him off and, and I had a brush hook and I let him have it. <laughs> when I was only 14, I went out to uh, Chester's out of, out of Springbrook, Numba Valley. My brother and cousin, they all worked there with Indians and Greeks and Italians. And that is enormous fun. Old Chester, he developed all of Mount Cavat. He owned his big property. And they used to have a big waterfall in the middle of their farm and they used to zigzag their bananas down. And they had Thursday Island boys working there with them. And they, they hated snakes. So the boys up in the, up in the bananas used to, if a carpet snake would be hanging around, the, wrapped around the punch, they used to leave him there and send it down to the shed. And we were about two kilometres up in the mountain, you can hear him screaming, <laughs> running out of the shed. <laughs> when we first grew bananas, we used to grow a crop of beans in them. Two rows of beans in them. And the beans, we would, uh, we used to use, start planting about April in the winter time when they couldn't grow them on the flats. And we used to always make pretty good money out of beans and that would pay for you cleaning your uh, 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 land for the dozer or whatever it was and your fertiliser to keep going. You'd make that money and you should, you'd still make a bit of money for yourself out of the beans. We used to get a uh, bunch of top people come around. Uh, uh, they had gangs to go through the plantations and pick out any bunchy top and they rip them apart and spray them with kerosene. It, it never ever eradicated them, bunchy top, but uh, just control it, yeah. Oh, it's a lot of work, a lot of work. You've got to strip them and spray them for beetle. We get a lot of beetle. And uh, also there's vermin that eat the roots away. You've got to clean it and put poison around them. And uh, special oils, you've got to spray on them, stop the uh, diseases getting into them. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. Bag them? Yes. Yes. 
you have a big rod yeah. with a big rubber band yeah. and you put the bag over the end of the hoop like that, put the yeah. rubber band in and you put it up underneath the bunches, then you flick, pull the thing and it just and the rubber band comes off and ties yeah. the plastic bag up on it. When, when you get too many suckers around suckers, the uh, yeah. uh, stool, you've got to cut the small ones out and leave, I, I think you leave a couple down. A couple, yeah, mm. because once the bunch is on, you cut the stool down. It's no good. Yeah. And then when it stormed, you got a mattock and you went out in the storm and where the water run down the, the 17 acres, that's where you made a drain. And they used to have 44-gallon drums sitting in, in their bananas with a little a sheet of iron on it, and they had to catch their water. And they'd go around with little knapsacks and spray, you know. It was a fine day, they'd go up a little bit of spraying. I don't know, it's dangerous because I think yeah, a lot of people, if they used it today, they'd die from it. Didn't wear nothing in them mm. days. Just shorts and shirt, whatever. First, we used to be all cases. And then uh, we used to single pack them in cases. And, uh, and then the cartons came in. And then uh, we used to hand off and wash them in water and pack them in hands. You'd be chasing cases because they couldn't get the logs in, they couldn't cut the cases. I remember down at Conley's there, it got that bad a wet season. People used to go there and I had a bloke there that slept in his big truck the night. First on the thing would get his cases. Used to line up at the case mill to get cases at 2 o'clock in the morning. Get in line. So I said, nah. So I got myself a big saw, 54 inch saw, and I had a tractor. And I used to get long, I had a big truck, used to bring logs in and uh, break them down. And she used to help me to cut cases. And we had our own cases. One year I had to, uh, I put them in and uh, I had to go away to India and neighbours' cattle got in and ate the lot. And that year it was $60 a carton and I never had a banana. Sometimes when the price were down, well, you, you couldn't get, ca well, you couldn't afford a casual labour, you know, they'd say, you know, it's, you, well, I'm not making nothing. How can I afford wages? So, you know, you should just have to depend on yourself or on the family or work the long hours. That was all about seven days a week or whatever it was, 12, days, 12 hours a day. You had to work to catch up and do all your work on your plantation. But then it was wet. You could have a week or two weeks off, it was all right. And then you could, you know, when to find up, you could go back and, and catch up again, you know, sort of thing, you know. It was a good life. I, I, I'll never regret what, you know, what I did. But, you know, this sort of thing. But then after that, it, uh, North Queensland got too big. It was only the thing. And we would send our banana, they wouldn't pay us anything for our fruit. They wanted there because they're, they're the biggest growers. Some of them were sending up to 30,000 cartons a week. And big growers. And what, you send about 200, 200 cases a, a week? Or 100, you know, they didn't want you. They said, oh, I'll bug around with him. Even if your fruit was as good as theirs, you would not get the top money. But they bought one line of the same bananas, which of one grower, and they said, well, that is better for us. And, and we don't have to muck around chasing these blokes, you know. And, and, and that's what it got to. They used to bunch prune. Now, you've got a 12-hand bunch or a 14-hand bunch of bananas, that's a big, nice, big bunch. And the bottom hands might be the bigger, you get the bigger grade up stop automatic, and the grades get smaller. They used to bunch prune nearly half the bunch off. Three quarters of half the bunch because it was all small. They didn't want, they didn't want smalls. They didn't want mediums. They didn't want large at the end. They want extra large fruit. So don't you think you're working hard? You're fertilising, doing anything, and you cut half your bunch off? Aren't you cutting your own throat really? Then those fruit processors they closed too. They couldn't get enough bananas because the growers were there. And we used to, you know, and, and then we couldn't sell sell our bananas anywhere. We just have to just. Leave them in the paddock or anybody had cattle, they'd bring them and feed to the cows. I reckon it's a shame that the industry did go out off the tweed. But I reckon, it, it, you know, like, if there was money in there, I've got three sons, they've all got good jobs. And if the banana industry was still good, I think I'd still have a son up there doing the bananas and I'd be helping him.
you know, like if there was money in it. I reckon he would have a sort of a better life because he worked for sort himself that way. But it didn't happen that way. He used to have a, a marvellous time and, and it was the, the, the camaraderie, you know, what they call it. Uh, uh, and we all used, sort of knew one another. There was no problem whatsoever working with uh, different people and different nationalities and all that. There was no discrepancy amongst anyone whatsoever, no. We just all worked together and worked hard and done everything together as we should do. Well, important to me now, I'm, I'm retired and uh, I don't have to get up in, in the morning thinking that I'm going to cut cane today, it's been raining and be wet all day and cut a hole in the bag and arms out and to keep warm. I don't have to do that no more. And uh, one good hit, and uh, you uh, go through. And sometime it comes through so fast, it hits the other, the, the, the left leg. I got little ladders all up my legs. <laughs> and you probably see little marks up yeah. my legs there. Yeah. That's when I cane knives. I cut my knee a few times, cutting the limb, you know, just cut across. Yeah. You used to have a lot of cuts and bruises on your legs from cane knives and that, yeah. We used to wrap a, tear a part of your shirt off or something like that and you wrap it around and just keep going. On this one, you can see that there, mm. that, that the knife went through and my foot dropped. And then I, I used to, the doctor said to me, he said, look, make yourself a shield out of aluminium. So those, uh, Big pipe, water pipes, was aluminium, and I cut it in half, and uh, and I put straps around it. I used to put a strap there, and the knife come through. I never hurt me. <laughs> I had a gang, yes, and uh, you had to keep them in time and uh, be level-headed with them. You can high and fire. You uh, always work good if you're happy. The gang negotiated the prices with the farmers. Sometimes the farmers. <laughs> Didn't like giving you much money. They just said, no, you can't get that. Even when it's rat eating and lying, laying down and all that, you might be only getting threepence or sixpence a ton. The ganger was just a ganger, but everybody had to work just as hard as him because everybody got the equal pay. Now, the mill had the price of the ton, but it was really bad cane. You had to get that bit of extra money off the farmer. And the farmer was good enough. He said, all right, boys, I'll give it to you. And the boys were more happy they would cut the cane better, but if there's some dispute, they would have to go to inspector. The inspector would say, that's all I can give you. And if he wasn't satisfied, they go to an arbitrator that comes around, and he takes the thing in the paddock, he said, that's all, you, all that's worth, that's all he's going to get. So they used to be always whinging, oh, no, we can't give you that much money. No, if you've got a couple of shillings on, on uh, a ton extra, oh, they cry their eyes out. <laughs> the two-year-old cane, nobody liked that because it was very big and hard to handle and, and you couldn't get the tonnage. It was big, but it was a lot of slower work, you know. Standing up cane was much easier to cut and drop and you'd, it, 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 you'd do more tonnage in a day. The worse the cane, the more, a little bit more money you got. There was tricks in everything like and, and that. 
some of the blokes, there, there, there was difference in the row. The drain row used to be a heavier row too because it was more drain, so I've got the canes on the flat and, and the cane doesn't like a lot of water. And they used to be the heaviest rows. And a lot of blokes didn't want to get them rows because they knew they had to cut more cane. So they'd sort of hang back and, you know, go over and just they'd make sure they didn't sort of get it. The first season on the Clarence, we had a cook. And he used to get as, just the same as us, each man. And he used to get, get up two o'clock in the morning and start cooking. <laughs> so we used to live in the barracks down in Kindra, and I used to be the cook. We used to go home and get the fire going for the bath, get the potatoes and everything else going to make the curries and everything to work, and, you know, for, the, for the, when they come home, make sure everything was going. So when they come home, they had a shower. Then they used to have a few rums or whatever. And, uh, yeah, so I was to cook for a fair while. Well, they had bad paddocks, which I said, looked at and it's all growing up. It went down, it's doing about 60, 70 tonne a year. It's but they would stand it over, it should be cut. And you got a wet season, they'd just stand it over. The main plant drops and then you get the suckers grows up, see? And then when you go to cut it, the suckers, they don't want, the farmers don't want the sucker because the sucker's got no sugar in it. They say, cut the sucker, but throw it out. Don't put it in the heap, see? And the cutters were not making that money. They still had to work, throw their money out. They said, oh, we're not going to do that with a bag. Well, then that extra money, what they sort of give to, you had to do it, you do it. And they couldn't make the money, and a lot of times they used to, uh, <laughs> they used to have a candle. They put it in the middle of the paddock, clean around it and just have a bit of thrash on the bottom. That candle might take two hours or an hour and a half to burn. We'd be sitting in the pub and they'd say, oh, that paddy's going up now. The candle used to go down a lot and the fire would go up with 10, 15 acres of rubbish would burn and then they'd get other gangs in to help you cut it out. They used to say, you bastards, you dribbled it with that. <laughs> we're going to get you back and we're going to do the same thing to you. <laughs> so they used to get their rubbish sort of cut off. There might be five or six gangs in to cut it, eh? Used to blame the foxes. Foxes who burnt the tar and ran through the paddock somewhere else and let it go. <laughs> that was another good one. <laughs> you get some blokes there, you know, you can work near them all day and they tell the jokes all day. <laughs> they used to get the snakes, dead snakes, burnt snakes, and put them in the bundle of cane. When you lifted them up, the heads used to come down, you dropped the cane and everything, and you'd have the smell on you for the rest of the day because that was pretty on the nose. Yeah, they used to do that with snakes and rats and bandicoots and whatever they could find. You work as a team of blokes and you've got good blokes, they joke and argue all day. See, you get us in a big cane doing 100 tonnes of the acre. I wouldn't have enough heart with a cane knife to go and cut the bloody thing. Hell, what am I going to do? How am I going to cut it? How am I going to pull it out? All this sort of thing. But you get a team of blokes in. You get ten blokes together. One's pushing the other. He might be bugging, like, it's a hot day. But he's making the pace. They said, oh, he's making the pace. We've got to stay with him. And one sort of said, oh, the other bloke got to keep up with smoke, might catch fire. Some used to be that bad. They to, if they caught him up, they'd take the row off him. That was an assault to a cane cutter. We did work with a few uh, South Sea Islanders and Fijians, yes. They worked well together. You know, us, uh, the dark people and the white people worked well together in the cane. They did, and the bananas and everything else. We have all the hard work, so there was a lot of mixture of people that really knew how to work and work hard. It was a, a unity of men. And, uh, and I miss that today. I... Uh, we used to look forward to signing on day. The women used to cut too, the Italian women, and they, they could cut cane. And even load, shoulder load. We used to go to strip the cane. What we used to do was we used to cut the cane for planting, and that's how we used to strip the cane. The cane would come down, it would be cut for us, and it'd be in a big bundle, right, on the ground. So we'd pick it up, the tip would be off it and the root would be off it and we'd just strip down like that. We'd just take a piece and strip it all the way down so that there was no thrash left on it whatsoever. And then they'd put it in the planter and feed it through the planter and it'd cut every so many notches and that's where it'd shoot. The eyes would come out 
right near where the where you stripped it to. That's why you had to strip it off so the eyes could come out. Oh, we had to have a pair of gloves on, yeah. but we just um, stripped all the dead stuff off. There was one particular cane that was awful to work with. They call it Hairy Mary, and you had to have you know long sleeves, long all protective clothing, or you'd get that in your skin. And you know you could get little festers and turn into boils if you weren't careful. Um, but there was a couple other good ones that was that you could strip without getting all hair on you. You know, but there was a red cane in particular. I think it was called Pinder, and it was easy and good to strip. But as soon as they mentioned Hairy Mary, <laughs> we didn't like that. <laughs> uh, I used to drink at the courthouse mainly, and then we have a shower there and have about three or four schooners every afternoon come out. The old publicans loved our money, even the bar was black. It was all black and they're drinking and they didn't care about the bar getting black, they just want their money because they used to drink heavy and work and they had the money. But now today if the cane cutters went in anyone who dirt and dirt that bar, they wouldn't even let you in the bloody pub. We kept this place going, there's no doubt about it. The jokes are the old blokes, how the money the cane cutter used to put in here. But now you've got these machines, they're not, they're taking it out of the bloody district. They had everything around Mobulumba. It was a very, very rich little place. When the harvesters came first down, we was a little bit disappointed because they had them on trial run there to start with and they was breaking down all the time. And we said, good, we get a couple more years out of this, you know, because we're making good money out of it. And then when the harvester did come in, we said, that's all right, now we're getting a bit old now for this game, so we thought, well, that's all right. Well, off season, I used to go down to the farmers and uh, Kindra there, and I used to go through chip and cane for them there in the off season. Then uh, I used to go out spraying blackberries uh, out at Nundal, Walker, and Bendemeer and all them places. And sometimes we used to go to Bathurst on the way down to Melbourne. We'd take the trucks back down to Melbourne, stop at Bathurst spraying uh, uh, blue wattle. And uh, we used to do all that in the off season. A season would go from about um, early July through to December. And um, then he'd go on to fishing and the, until the next season started in the, in the sugar cane. But most of the workers around here all did the same thing. They'd either go fishing or working the fields. Most of the farmers had um, crops, small crops, peas and beans. So that's where they'd get their living from when the cane season finished. We'd all go out picking beans, peas, when the, whatever was ready, you know, at the time, yes. Mainly it was in the winter time. And I'll tell you, you didn't want to get out of bed on a winter's morning. <laughs> my dad used to go prawning because my dad had a, a fishing licence as well. He was a professional fisherman as well as a cane cutter. And um, he used to have oysters as well. He had an oyster lease down the front. And he used to go prawning, fishing, and we'd have all these seafoods, you know. My elder sister, she used to open the oysters and they'd bottle them in either little ladies' waste bottles or pickle bottles, and he'd sell them. So then he, he also grew uh, watermelons, Indian creams, rock melons, cucumbers, and corn, and we'd have plenty of mangoes, so he'd take those out along the beachfront at Kingscliff every Christmas. Um, all the campers would go from Woman Bay right down to, nearly to the creek and there'd be a road right through the middle and he'd go down with his old truck and he'd just sell all his fruit and we'd go with him. We were only little kids about this high and he'd be singing out, you know, watermelons, <laughs> guaranteed ripe and, you know, we'd be hiding in the back seat <laughs> so no one would see us in case there was someone we knew. And all the South Sea Islanders had grapes and pineapples so there was little stalls everywhere along the, the road selling them. And my dad used to come down here to the ferry and he'd have mud crabs, grapes, pineapples, whatever he could, and they'd wait for all the cars to come across the ferry just down here on the river. And that's how they'd sell a lot of their produce as well. 
instead of getting on the social service, I went out to make ends meet, you know, by working. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was away nine years. I cut timber. It was a dangerous game, and it got killed three times. Some years I've uh, went out spraying blackberries, and uh, used to start from uh, Lynn Ennis and right through to Gippsland. And uh, we used to stop in sheds and that, you know. One thing led to another. I went roo shooting and I'd done that a couple of years out there. And uh, then I got on to uh, 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 underground mining. I worked in timber, cutting timber, cordwood for Byron Bay Meatworks. I worked in bananas. I bought uh, 15 acres on Mays Hill, north of Balgam, up on the top. And um, I grew bananas there. The best part about bananas is you're doing some work in them, you can take a day off. See, it was a family sort of business. Yeah. Wife would do the packing, the kids on the weekend helped me cut. And in the school holidays, I'd go up and help me strip or whatever job was done. But I'd pay them a bit of pocket money. They were all happy. I hate bananas when I had to go to. I didn't work in the bananas anyway, just packing. That's in all. The in the shed, that's all. Because sometimes it, uh, uh, snakes in the bunch. <laughs> yes, no, oh, I don't know. I didn't like it. Yes. Yeah, the kids used to be here. They used to make the cases underneath there. They make them every day after to the school. Or, He's going to make 150 cases a day or all this. They'd make them. I used to um, do the ends of the cases. But we'd pull over a pack, of, a lot of uh, cases that were sort of packed and tied together the timber, sit on that and then uh, start making the, uh, that we put two boards together and cleats along the top, bang, 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 and just wind them up. Sometimes I'd start cases too, but uh, that used to be my job if I did. But I spent most of the time cooking and doing things like that in the house. But Mum used to do it all. She'd uh, make ends, she'd make the cases and she'd pack. And she used to give my young brother some bananas and some nails and a hammer. And to occupy his mind, he used to hammer nails into the bananas that weren't any good. And then Mum would later on, after the day was finished, kept asking him to put them in a certain place. She'd take all the nails out. I remember seeing her taking all the nails out of these bananas and putting them in with the, the good nails because they weren't bent or anything. But that would occupy him for ages. I started in the bananas down at Mullumimbi, but we also started in bananas when we were nine, ten years old. Help Mum out. Because Mum, that's the only thing Mum had to... Uh, live off at that time it was the bananas and us kids was only very small and we cut bananas, pack bananas, make the cases. We got the bananas steamed at Condong Mill, the suckers. We walked them out around the mountain. You took a bar, a shovel and a mattock and you moved rocks and made holes. We dug the holes with the mattock, 17 acres we done. We are doing nine hours a day. We was I was getting 12 pounds a week. Oh, there's farms up in Tom in there that are that steep. Mm. You, uh, they had ropes and that hanging down the side. It was there, you can pull yourself up. When the first started back in the 50s, they used to have these uh, flying foxes in the, in the paddocks. There was no, you couldn't get up, but there was no roads. And they used to still cut a fair bit of bananas because all you had to do is you didn't want a vehicle. You'd walk up cut your bananas and put them on the stages and send them down by the flying fox or by wire to the shed. There's very deadly snakes. Death adders and yeah, rough scale and uh, king brown and the uh, eastern brown. They're very, very deadly. And uh, I've had, when I was at working at Numanbar Valley for George Chester and son, I had a, a death hat, I got round my boot and bit the boot. <laughs> and I looked down and there's a, a big snake around me ankle. And I uh, shook him off and 
And I had a brush hook and I let him have it. <laughs> when I was only 14, I went out to uh, Chester's out of, out of Springbrook, Number Valley. My brother and cousin, they all worked there with Indians and Greeks and Italians. And that is enormous fun. Old Chester, he developed all of Mount Cavat. He owned his big property. And they used to have a big waterfall in the middle of their farm. And they used to zigzag their bananas down. And they had Thursday Island boys working there with them. And they, they hated snakes. So the boys up in the, up in the bananas used to, if a carpet snake would be hanging around, the, wrapped around the punts, they to leave him there and send it down to the shed. And we were about two kilometres up in the mountain, you can hear him screaming, <laughs> running out of the shed. <laughs> when we first grew bananas, we used to grow a crop of beans in them. Two rows of beans in them. And the beans, we would, uh, we used to start planting about April, in the winter time when they couldn't grow them on the flats. And we used to always make pretty good money out of beans and that would pay for you cleaning your uh, 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 land for the dozer or whatever it was and your fertiliser to keep going, you'd make that money and you should, you'd still make a bit of money for yourself out of the beans. We used to get a uh, bunch of top people come around and uh, uh, they had gangs to go through the plantations and pick out any bunch of top and they rip them apart and spray them with kerosene. It, it never ever eradicated them, Bunchy Top, but uh, just controlled it, yeah. Oh, it's a lot of work, a lot of work. You've got to strip them and spray them for beetle. We get a lot of beetle. And uh, also there's vermin that eat the roots away. You've got to clean it and put poison around them. And uh, there's special oils, you've got to spray on them, stop the uh, diseases getting into them. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. Bag them? Yes. Yes. Just have a big rod. Yeah. With a big rubber band. Yeah. And you put the bag over the end of the hoop, like that. Put the yeah. rubber band in. And you put it up underneath the bunches. Then you flick, pull the thing and it just, and the rubber band comes off and ties yeah. the plastic bag up on it. When, when you get too many suckers around suckers, the uh, yeah. uh, stool, you've got to cut the small ones out and leave, I, I think you leave a couple, don't you? Couple, yeah. Mm. Because once the bunch is on, you cut the stool down. It's no good. Yeah. And then when it stormed, you got a mattock and you went out in the storm and where the water run down the, the 17 acres, that's where you made a drain. And they used to have 44 gallon drums sitting in, in their bananas with a little a sheet of iron on it, and that would catch their water. And they'd go around with little knapsacks and spray, you know, it was a fine day to go up and do a bit of spraying. I know it is dangerous yeah, it's because I think a lot of people, if they used it today, they'd die from it. Didn't wear nothing in them days. Just shorts and shirt, whatever. First we used to be all cases, and then we used to single pack them in cases, and, uh, and then the cartons came in. And then uh, we used to hand off and wash them in water and pack them in hands. You'd be chasing cases because they couldn't get the logs in, they couldn't cut the cases. I remember down at Conley's there, it got that bad a wet season. People used to go there and I had a bloke there that slept in his big truck the night. First on the thing would get his cases. Used to line up at the case mill to get cases at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. Get in line. So I said, nah. So I got myself a big saw, 54 inch saw, and I had a tractor. And I used to get long, I had a big truck, used to bring logs in and uh, break them down. And she used to help me to cut cases. And we had our own cases. One year I had to, uh, I put them in and uh, I had to go away to India, a neighbour's cattle got in and ate the lot. And that year, it was $60 a carton and I never had a banana.
Sometimes when the price were down, well, you, you couldn't get, ca well, you couldn't afford a casual labour, you know, they'd say, you know, it's, you, well, I'm not making nothing. How can I afford wages? So, you know, you should have just had to depend on yourself or on the family or work the long hours. That was all about it. Seven days a week or whatever it was, 12, days, 12 hours a day, you had to work to catch up and do all your work on your plantation. But then it was wet. You could have a week or two weeks off, it was all right. And then you could, you know, when to find up, you could go back and, and catch up again, you know, sort of thing, you know. It was a good life. I, I, I'll never regret what, you know, what I did. But, you know, this sort of thing. But then after that, it, uh, North Queensland got too big. It was only the thing. And we would send our banana. They wouldn't pay us anything for our fruit. They wanted there because they're, they're the biggest growers. Some of them were sending up to 30,000 cartons a week. And big growers. And what you send about 200, 200 cases a, a week, or 100, you know, they didn't want you. They said, oh, I'll bug around with him. Even if your fruit was as good as theirs, you would not get the top money. But they bought one line of the same bananas, which of one grower, and they said, well, that is better for us. And, and we don't have to muck around chasing these blokes, you know. And, and, and that's what it got to. They used to bunch prune. Now, you've got a 12-hand bunch or a 14-hand bunch of bananas, that's a big, nice, big bunch. And the bottom hands might be the bigger, you get the bigger grade up stop automatic and the grades get smaller. They used to bunch prune nearly half the bunch off. Three quarters of half the bunch because it was all small. They didn't want they didn't want smalls, they didn't want mediums. They didn't want large at the end, they want extra large fruit. So don't you think you're working hard, you're fertilizing, you're doing anything, and you cut half your bunch off? Aren't you cutting your own throat really? Then those fruit processors, they close too. They couldn't get enough bananas because the growers were there. And we used to, you know, and, and then we couldn't sell, sell our bananas anywhere. We just have to just leave them in the paddock where anybody had cattle, they'd bring them and feed to the cows. I reckon it's a shame that the industry did go out off the tweed. But I reckon, it, it, you know, like, if there was money in there, I've got three sons, they've all got good jobs. And if the banana industry was still good, I think I'd still have a son up there doing the bananas and I'd be helping him. You know, like if there was money in it, I reckon he would have a sort of a better life because he's working for sort of self that way. But it didn't happen that way. He used to have a, a marvellous time and, and it was the, the, the camaraderie, you know, what they call it. Uh, uh, and we all knew, sort of knew one another. There's no problem whatsoever working with uh, different people and different nationalities and all that. There was no discrepancy amongst anyone whatsoever, no. We just all worked together and worked hard and done everything together as we should do. Well, important to me now, I'm, I'm retired and uh, I don't have to get up in, in the morning thinking that I'm going to cut cane today, it's been raining and be wet all day and cut a hole in the bag and arms out and to keep warm. I don't have to do that no more.